So, Shankar, I need to uh, quickly talk about this. We do have equations in the papers. <laughs> I want to clarify this. Um, but today I'm going to mostly show the device we built and also the main uh, thought process behind we doing these five inspired robots. It's not just building stuff, but we have to decode biology uh, systems. Then we can take the lesson we learned to build robots. Okay, so I will, I think I have quite a few uh, slides, but I just run them uh, quickly to show the uh, main interesting things. So these are, you know, these are whatever you write in your proposals, right? So <laughs> basically, flying flight has some advantages. So we do flying and swimming, but mostly uh, flying. And this comes from my PhD work at Berkeley uh, with Shankar and also uh, my collaborator Luca uh, somewhere here. So, um, so at that time we were doing flight control simulations. And after I uh, go on be a faculty myself, uh, start my own lab, basically everything just uh, spin off in the sense that um, we study biological systems, get inspired to build robots. And then we try to use robotic system to decode biology, so sort of like Professor Michael Dickinson's uh, thought process in that aspect. So that involves all these different aspects. Uh, but of course, most of my students are dynamics and control robotics guys. And I do have like one, uh, student usually uh, on, robot, uh, on experimental fluids because for the forces and torques on the right hand side of the equation, we need to get it sometimes from the tank experiment <laughs> and some air experiment too. So these are quickly uh, some sample uh, results, uh, but I think I will mostly show the robot we have and uh, later you will see there's a um, sample here I have. Uh, so in order to go from biology system to robotic system, you need to so for example, like I said, decode some of the fluid phenomena and also try to see, for example, here, how hummingbird control its flight when it's being scared or things like that. And then you build your robot. In that case, you can extract the main information you need for your controls. So this, this is the only slide which is not from my lab. This is from um, Pro uh, Professor Michael Dickinson's lab when we were a grad student here. So what I want to show here is that this is very important to remember the wing the forces and torques on the wing, the direction and the magnitude vary instantaneously. It's very, very important to remember this because that basically says why the flight is so, uh, fly is so agile. And that's also why you need to decouple the left and right wings, not like the usual robots built uh, so far. So these are the experiments set up in my lab. I think I will quickly go through these slides, um, some of the tank experiments. And I will very quickly go through the uh, aerodynamics part, and then we go to control and dynamics. Uh, these are some case studies. We use ex experimental fluid setup to study, uh, for example, wing interactions in dragonflies. They use different phase angle between fore and hind wings at different flight modes. So what you can do is uh, you can build such a, a setup. This is uh, in my lab. So basically, you can uh, have any very high stroke plane angle, and you can simulate forward and uh, hovering flight. And we also have PIV system to measure the flow. So you can see, for example, at certain phase angle difference, the hind wing uh, has a lot of uh, force reduction. So that's why they never use that kind of uh, phase angle difference. So the flexible wing aerodynamics, I will also quickly uh, go through. This is what we have from tank experiments at different wing uh, flexibility, uh, flexural stiffness, basically. And then we figure out, OK, flexible wings have less force but more efficiency for your uh, aerodynamics. And also for the wing on the animals, what they want is they want some rigidity to enforce the, to get enough force, but they also want very light wings. So that's why they have very um, intricate Venetian patterns. And this is how you correlate leading edge vortex to uh, the, f the forces on the wing. And this is also how you study the timing of this. So I'm going to run through very quickly for the fluids part. So uh, again, this is just interesting to see. This is the first time we found the vortex rings um, beneath the flapping flight, uh, in the sense that for helicopters, it's, it's, the downwash is usually very uniform going downwards. But for the flapping flight, the downwash actually goes through the rings, basically like a zigzag kind of uh, motion. OK, so for the dynamics part, the train of thought is like this. So you observe some behavior from the animals by high-speed camera. Uh, to extract wing kinematics and body kinematics. And then what you do is uh, also from a quantized steady aerodynamic model or from tank experiment, you can get forces and torques for your right-hand side of equation. And if this one can more or less explain your flight behavior, 
let's say the matches the equations, then that means this is more or less, uh, we, we don't say it open loop, but in biology they, they call it open loop. But this is more, more or less passive, uh, not, not too much aggressive control. So from this route, we were able to de decouple um, the turning behavior of different animals. But if it's in some very aggressive behaviors, for example, recovering from upside down, you need to propose some, um, I mean, the open loop, the so-called open loop of passive control is not sufficient. So apparently the animal is using some very aggressive flight control strategies. So in that case, you can propose some flight control. Again, this is not just a simple app. It's a nonlinear coupled equations. Uh, and then if this so-called, you know, in biology literature, so-called closed loop dynamics is able to explain the behavior, then you are done. So this is basically um, how do you model dynamics and controls in real animals uh, so far. So, uh, a quick example is uh, turning behavior. For example, this is a hummingbird turning uh, 90 degree uh, actually, not, not only that, uh, make a your turn of 160 degree in very, very short time. This is the high-speed camera images. And also the fruit fly data we have uh, from Dickinson's lab. So what we found is that if you are, you know, whether you are downstroke, upstroke, turning left or right, you always have some resisting torque, which we call flapping counter torque, to act against the turning uh, direction. Uh, we went ahead to model this. So this is one sample of the equations. Uh, kind of messy, um, but what you can see that um, this flapping counter torque is proportional to the body turning velocity uh, and wind frequency. Others are like morphological parameters. So based on that, we were able to explain the passive uh, damping and also the turning behavior or the, you know, the, the turning velocity of different animals. So I talked with my biologist collaborator, actually Ty Hedrick, and uh, we were able to, and he was able to get a lot of data for different animals, for insects, birds, and bats, and look at how many wind beats does it take for the animal to slow down half life of turning, and that really ma matches what we predict from that model. Uh, so this is the this is the absolute time versus the turning maximum turning velocity of different animals at different uh, mass, and this is if you just not normalize them in terms of wind beats and maximum speed, you can categorize them into three. Um, I mean, actually, main two main categories. So basically bird type or insect type, which take about two wind beats. So in one sense, actually hummingbird belongs to this group and hawk moth belongs to the other one. So sometimes if biologists tell you, okay, hummingbird flies more like an insect, hawk moth flies more like a bird, and this is the reason why. Uh, so again, um, not only your turn, that's only, only your turn, but also raw pitch your, uh, and also XYZ, we all, we all found this phenomenon and then model it. So some of the aggressive behaviors, um, I quickly go through, be then we, we talk about the robot. If you try to scare the hawk moth and it will, try, it will try to recover from upside down after it's been uh, destabilized, and this process, we try to model the, uh, the, the behavior and try to look at the control strategy, strategy behind it. Unless you look at the data, actually you will never find out you know, what is the essential part for the control. So for this kind of behavior, it is actually the rotational angular rate that is really proportional to the pitch angle. Um, so we were able to find that. So again, the details are in the papers. Um, so for the previous three years, I have a, a set ground for the hummingbird flight control. What we do is, I, I work with a biologist in uh, University of Montana, uh, Brett Hobaski. He's uh, he has a, his lab has a set up high speed cameras, and what we did is when a hummingbird is trying to feed from the feeder, again you try to scare it from the front and look at the uh, escaping behavior. Uh, in fact, um, this is what we uh, this is the typical behavior of a hummingbird uh, making an escape turn. So we did like several species, uh, ranging from three grams to eight grams, and. Um, what we found is that they all have some similar behaviors. This is almost like optimal trajectory. Like you, they, they, instead of making the your turn like this, they will pitch up and roll. So this is very efficient in, in the, as a matter of fact. And also, regardless of the initial conditions, they will always go to one initial condition and make that stereotypical turn. So this is something we are studying right now to see, okay, if this is an optical pro optimal problem in terms of minimum time. So these are some of the results. But I think uh, what I want to show is, let me just skip this. These are raw pitch, uh, I mean, pitch and roll 
dynamics. What I want to show here is some of the latest robots we built. So you know for micro air vehicles, we ha they have fixed rotary and flapping wings, right? For flapping, what I want to focus on the flapping here, uh, the ones that can hover insects and hummingbirds, and the ones which fly forward, you can build, on, uh, build ornithopters. So what I want to focus is the hovering capable uh, flapping wing uh, type. So uh, two kinds, two types, basically, based on actuation. So there's the uh, Harvard's Rob has his uh, Robo B at Harvard. This is based on piezo uh, actuation. So piezo basically will take at, at least 150 volts input. Um, for, and then there's motor based. Motor, motor based is most inf uh, famous is the nano hummingbird from Air Environment. So they were successful flying in 2009, actually. So and also they'll fly, of course, but they'll fly. Uh, this is what I don't want to, um, uh, say, how to say it, the thing is, the two wings are coupled and the tail <coughs> rotor, uh, the tail is kind of controlled. So this is more like a helicopter kind of control. So what I want to focus is on is you, if you can independent, independently control the two wings, that's the key basically. Otherwise you defeat the purpose, you can build a rotor, uh, rotor craft. Okay, so, but another thing, one thing about the nano hummingbird is what I like is about the string basically here. They get, ri get rid of the four bar by replacing it with a string. So that's very efficient, reduce the inertia power uh, consumption. Another thing, but again, if you look at inside structure, it's very complicated, uh, very intricate. So there's no way, I mean, you could try to mass produce it, but it's uh, very, very, uh, um, how to say it, could be easy to break at the weakest link, right? If you have m many, many weakest link, then that will be uh, the problem. So this is what we have in the lab. We build our own electromagnetic actuator, um, which can achieve high frequency flapping. So in order to hover, you have to achieve beyond certain frequency to do that. And also this is motor based. We have two types, basically. Uh, these are previous ones. So the, the main uh, similarity is they can do high frequency flapping, they can hover, and also they can, um, they are independently controlled wings. So that's a key, basically. Y you can um, independently control the two wings. So subtle change of the wing kinematics, you can just set a fly into different flight course. Uh, this is basically the electromagnetic uh, actuator um, principle. This is very uh, simple. For so basically, you have a rotor, uh, you, you have your stator is your uh, coil, and you have a rotor is your uh, permanent magnetic. So that you can just change your current and then it will flap back and forth. But again, to, in, to achieve a resonance flapping, we add additional permanent magnetic on the sides so that the two, the interaction of the two, basically you create a resonance system. So you can tune the magnetic so that you can tune your uh, flapping frequency. So this, for a bigger size, we have some, somewhere around 90 hertz. For smaller size, uh, like the one I have here, it's about one, 160 hertz uh, flapping frequency. So you can tune that. So basically, this is a virtual spring. So you can see that whatever, the, uh, there's no four bar, there's no, only contact point is the rotor itself. So this one lasts like two, three years, no problem. And the piezo-based or flexor joint-based, uh, they are very uh, brittle, actually, last maybe um, a lot. Uh, Last time. So, this is how we were uh, when we were first success successful building this actuator. How we tune the resonant frequency. For example, the first one is about 70 hertz um, at the very beginning, and then at the resonant frequency, you can see the wind kinematics are pretty smooth and nice. Uh, beyond that, you have different uh, harmonics. I see. So, okay. So, I think I need to run very fast. This one I will just skip. Um, I show some other videos. This is the wind starting to lift a couple of years ago, and then I will show you some other um, videos. I need to actually really rush forward. So this, th these are the specs, and this is how we control the wing kinematics, and some of the coupling we found between, between left and right wings, and they will try to sync together, actually, for different frequencies, if you actuate them at different frequencies. Uh, how the wings are made, and fracture joint, how it's optimized, and these are all in the papers. Um, so let me quickly skip and show some of the videos. These are controls for individual access. And this is a scaling down of a smaller version, which I have here. Uh, it's not yet controlled yet, 
but it was able to uh, lift itself. So we are working on the control now. So this one is, uh, is this one, it's, it's itself. It's, this is not a dummy prototype, it's a working prototype. So let me go through the, a couple of videos for this one and then um, we'll be done. So for this special prototype, this is another, um, this is a motor-based MAV in the sense that I just showed two videos, that's okay. So we use Vicon to control this for now, but we do have a different version which has all the electronics on board. So everything, basically you can see there's potential to make it uh, autonomous. And this is a slow motion. And this frame is only for making it stable when it's starting from zero to 40 hertz uh, frequency. And those are for the Vicon tracking uh, trackers, basically. So this is the latest right now. And I think for high frequency flapping wing, uh, robot. This is the um, hummingbird size, especially. This is the first one which was able to achieve uh, uh, stable hovering with attitude control. Uh, this is one last video I want to show for the fish robot in the lab. This is a very uh, simple one. You can track a color. Mm, but what I want to show with this is that we have built a very ac uh, silent actuator so that there's no sound, basically. If you use servo or motor, you will have a, you know, a lot more uh, sound compared to this. So the idea is to see if we can use this to track the real fish and without disturbing them. So, uh, I think uh, that's, I think for the sake of the time, I cannot go into all the details for each one. And uh, I want to thank Shankar for introducing us to the wonderful field of research and Indeed, it is like a very beautiful garden out there. Excellent. So do we have uh, one question while our next speaker sets up? Yes. Shankar. How far are you from uh, really flying uh, robots? The flapping wing flying robots? Yes, uh, the video you saw, it, it's able to take off and stably hovering. So attitude control is there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, but right now, um, because of the second version of the electronics we, we built, the gyro is not so good. <laughs> so we use the Vicon to look at it. And, and uh, bigger payloads? Oh, uh, oh, I forgot to mention. The hummingbird size is 12 grams by the weight, uh -huh. but the lift is 20 grams. Uh -huh. So we, we hold some uh, lift to, yeah. to see how much it can lift off. You know, I was uh, reading uh, Leonardo da Vinci for, you know, for the, there was a commencement and I had and wanted a Leonardo da Vinci <laughs> quote. But really, you should take a look because they were, he was dreaming in the yeah. 16th century of uh, flying uh, robots. So, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. So, yeah, w I think uh, for hopefully this summer we can get everything, you know, uh, we can get the position control. So, so yeah, so attitude control, it's no problem now. Yeah. Let's thank Shenyang one more time. Thank you. <laughs>